Hey everybody, Greg here. In this video we're going to be looking at a process I use, a workflow that I use for converting audio from cassette tapes to digital files. Now this process would be similar for let's say LP records, um, but some of the columns in this spreadsheet, the checklist, would be a little different and you'll see that in just a minute. So I've brought up the spreadsheet um, in some columns, uh, in some rows above that you don't see here are other projects I've worked on with clients and I list their names and projects there. But for um, privacy, I'm not going to be using actual customer data here. So anyway, for each customer, um, I begin with their name in a column and then you know to the left of that an identifier for the tape. So if it's the first tape they've given me then it's you know side A and side B of that first tape. As they would give me uh, more projects to work on I would add in a 2A and 2B etc. Um, and those would just increase over time. It's my own sort of serial number for um, e the projects over time. And uh, anyway um, in this third column here, you can see I put the date and time of the import. So that becomes in this spreadsheet almost like a unique serial number because that year, month, day, and you know minute is not going to come up again. Um, and so I can also sort projects based on if I'm trying to find one from six months ago, I can easily sort on date and go back and find that. And then you know if the cassette tape has a description on it, I will put that here in this column that uh, has descriptive information. I might, depending on the project, I might go ahead also and you know take a picture of the cassette box or you know case, any notes there, any notes written on the cassette tape itself, just to have that archival material and keep that in a folder under the client's name. And then Often I will go through and remove the recording tabs, and, and this would be the case also with video conversion, because I want to make sure it's not going to, uh, you know, it's not possible to accidentally erase over somebody's uh, tape. And so, um, you know, I may or may not do that, and I'll indicate that in this column here. <clears throat> and then I have uh, a couple of tape decks I work with and I indicate in this column here what cassette deck was used because I, it may be relevant later. You know, if there begins to be some squealing noise that I notice or uh, some issue with certain tapes, maybe one deck would work better than another, um, depending on the cassette or the project. So I indicate that. And then I have a couple of different analog to digital converters. Now, these basically... Um, plug into the back of the cassette deck where there's RCA audio out left and right and then those RCA cables typically go to a you know a box or a little dongle adapter looking thing um, and then from there it's USB into the computer so I make a note of that as well to over time get a sense of you know is one device performing a little better than another um, I found they, they operate basically the same, but it's just a record of what equipment was used. And then Audacity is the software I typically use, but I'll put that down. I'll indicate what version it is, and if I used some other software as well for cleaning up the audio, I might put that there. I don't do a lot of work with the editing. I certainly will trim the beginning and end of a tape if there's you know, nothing at the beginning or a long pause at the beginning, I'll cut that out, or a long pause at the end, I'll cut that out. And um, if there are volume level issues, I will sort of adjust the volume accordingly. Uh, sometimes if the, the audio recording is too quiet and you boost it too much, then you get a lot of hiss sound in there because uh, there, there's a background noise anyway to that. And then there's also basic noise reduction. You can find a spot in the cassette tape where you hear that hiss or the background noise and you can sample that like an airplane going by let's say anyway you, you sample that and then you can subtract that out of the audio cassette but that's a little tricky also because sometimes the sound frequency of that interference or you know noise in the background can be 
very close to the spoken uh, or audio, whatever audio content it is, if it's music or a speech. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make a point of that. So that's, that's about the software, Audacity. And then recording level, 100%. That refers to the level in Audacity. Sometimes I would back that down a little if the tape was just too loud. Uh, I, I wouldn't want it to be like overmodulated, so that can be adjusted, but usually 100% is fine. Um, and then label tape, which is just a reminder to myself, make sure I you know, put a label on that tape and I'll label it you know, 1A and 1B, so that later when I'm working with a customer, if, it's, if they've given me a big box of cassette tapes, I can say, oh yeah, you know, on tape number uh, 15, side B, that, then we know what we're referring to because sometimes I get tapes that don't have any, um, you know, identifiable marks on them. There's no writing or anything, so I have to label them. And this reference system just it works well. And then the tape brand, tape class, the tape type, tape bias, tape EQ, um, and and even going all the way over here to you know, Dolby playback, minutes per side. So these are all things that. Uh, should be identifiable on the tape, the brand, and these other numbers refer to um, different types of cassette tape material. There were chrome and metal and different bias settings, and so this cassette deck that I have allows me to adjust from one to two to three to four uh, different type of tape settings, and the EQ that corresponds with that. Some would be 120, there's some that are 70. And um, so you, you want to, if possible, you know, you want to have a, not just some little pocket sized cassette player that just plays whatever tapes, but you want to get a nice deck that you can find on maybe Amazon used or eBay used um, that has these settings, you know. And then as far as Dolby, some cassette tape labels will have a little checkbox that says Dolby B or Dolby, you know, whatever kind of Dolby was used, uh, and, and if it was used or not, in many cases it wasn't, but if it was used, then you want to have Dolby um, on, on playback. That's been my understanding of that. Um, you don't have to, and you can also adjust that to your preference. You'll notice when Dolby's on, it will take out some of the kind of high frequency hissing noise, but it also will um, dampen other bright sounds if there's like music or something. So that's very much a preference, I guess, in some ways. And then I write down the minutes per side on the tape. I usually try to monitor the tape progress. I try to work on a project that I can do while I'm kind of listening to what's going on with this tape conversion. Um, or at least I will monitor the, the audio waveform, you know, so I can see, all right, it's still going. Um, but that 45 minute mark gives me an idea of, you know, do I have time to maybe run an errand if I needed to, or uh, I'm gonna be in the other room or whatever. Um, I wanna stop back around about the time that the tape's gonna finish up. Now, with the Audacity software, you know, if there was an emergency and I had to head out, you know, do some tech consulting or something like that, I could go away, uh, let the tape continue. The tape deck will stop at the end automatically. And then when I get back, the software would still be recording, nothing. So I would just trim that, you know, hour or two hours or three hours or whatever it might be, you know, off the end of the recording. Um, but I'd, I'd rather be present when I'm doing these because you know, if the tape were to start jamming up or something went wrong, I could be quick to react to that, you know? So that, that's the thing about the minutes per side. And then once I've completed the conversion or the, you know, the recording of that tape digitally, um, I, I write down how many audio minutes there were. So sometimes there'll be a tape where, um, it might just be 20 minutes, even though it's a 45 minute per side cassette tape. It could just be 40, uh, 20 minutes of audio, but I'll play it all the way through anyway, and I'll play both sides, the entirety of the tape on both sides, and I'll look at the waveform later to quickly determine if 
um, you know, if I had stepped away or if I'm just recording the entire side like that, um, I, I do want to just wait and see if maybe it's silent, you know, there's 20 minutes of, of audio, then it's silent for like another 20 minutes, and then at the very end of that tape, there could be another five minutes of audio or something. And if these are archival tapes or if there's something important on the tapes that somebody wants preserved, then I want to make sure I'm not missing anything, you know? So even if side B seems like it's empty, I'll go ahead and just let it play and then the tape will stop and I'll just kind of look at that waveform to confirm, yeah, there's nothing in there. Because sometimes a person might have taken a cassette tape and said, oh, I really want to record this. They pop the cassette tape in and just push record. And, you know, who knows what you get in the middle. Um, I'm just popping it in. And let me mention also, because this is relevant to that, of, you know, stray bits of audio on a tape. I had someone um, who had a, a really valuable tape to them and they wanted me to help convert it and it had been pulled out of the cassette case by uh, one of their kids and so there was just a you know, mess of all this tape, some crinkles in it and, and it was broken. There was a whole segment like broken off in there and just in a little baggie, you know. So um, that was quite a project. And I had to, by hand, you know, wind the tape very carefully, very slowly, trying not to get any, you know, oil from fingers. You, inevitably we have some sweat or oil or dirt or something. So you want to be wearing like um, cotton gloves or something that's not going to have uh, little pieces of dust or whatever. But carefully winding that tape um, back onto the cassette spool. And then as I was going, if, if you look at cassette tape on one side, it's sort of shiny and on the other side, it's a little bit of a matte surface. So um, I matched those up to know that, okay, at least I have the correct side because, you know, on one side there's magnetic material and on the other side it's just plastic basically. And so if I didn't get that right, there'd be like a gap in the middle of the cassette tape audio where it would suddenly cut out and have nothing because I had the, you know, if, if I were to have that magnetic tape on the wrong side. Anyway, so by taping that together, um, you know, holding those pieces and making sure that there was an identical cut or break or splicing area and putting a perfectly sized piece of tape on there and taping those, that allowed the full length of tape to go back into the case. And then when it was replayed, um, it, it sounded great. So that was uh, an example of a project where I, you know, had to piece it together and, and listen to it and make sure that um, that I didn't mistakenly have that turned around the other way. You know, people would be talking backwards, etc. It, it would sound, you know, sort of garbled and you wouldn't be able to make sense of the words. So, um, and, and that's under the repair required column. So if there was repair required, I would indicate that there, and I might also have some notes in a further column to the right, which I'll show you. And then a reminder to myself to rewind each tape. Um, it's, you know, in the old days, uh, there would be videotapes or cassette tapes, and um, the saying was, you know, be kind, rewind, or something. So you're, it's a courtesy to the next person who's going to be listening to that audio tape or watching the videotape. Well, of course, in this case, I'm not talking about returning a, a rental video to a video store. Um, this, the reason for rewinding now, in this example, is just simply to make sure that uh, the, the tape is safely and securely wound onto one of the spools. Let's say side A gets fully rewound. Um, and the tape stores better that way, and that way also it ensures that all of the tape is together, it's not going to be loose in there, and there's something on the end of the tape that's called a leader. It's just plastic without any magnetic recording material on it, and that plastic then is exposed, and it also wraps around the spool usually once or twice to protect the tape, theoretically, 
from you know oxidation and exposure to the elements. So anyway, that's why a person would want to rewind tapes even if they don't plan to be popping them in every day and listening to them. Um, so that's the rewind tape column. And then initial import, yes. Um, and what I mean by that is the there's an initial first time import into that Audacity software, uh, but that's only the first step. And then you'll see trim in and out, reminder to do that and mark off when that's done, and then save the project. So there's a difference between saving an MP3 file and saving an Audacity project. An Audacity project is a really high-grade audio, uh, like WAV format, it's a large file, and then any of these changes or edits um, that have been applied in Audacity, you can go back and tweak those later if you've saved the entire project. So it's important to do that, um, but usually the customer does not want an Audacity project, they just want an MP3 file. So um, but at least I've saved the project, so if they come back later and say, oh, could you just tweak this one little thing? I don't have to start all over again. I'm right there with the project file. I can make that tweak or adjustment and then send them an updated MP3 file. So then um, zoom to fill review. In Audacity, you can take the full uh, length of audio, let's say it is 45 minutes long, and you might have been, let's say, editing and looking at some detailed segments of that, but now you want to do zoom to fill and get a quick overview of the waveform and make sure there aren't any spots where it's low. This um, would be less of an issue if, let's say, somebody is at a podium and they have a speaker, an amplifier, PA system, and they're talking and they start and they stop and it's all kind of the same volume. Um, it becomes an issue though when they're interviews. So you have the person, sometimes it's the, the interviewer who is sitting next to the audio recorder and their voice is really loud and they ask the question and then the person responds and the person who responds, their voice is really soft because they're sitting across the table. So if the cassette deck wasn't originally placed like right in the middle of the table or if they didn't have you know, a microphone they were passing back and forth, then you get these kind of variations in the audio level between one person and another person talking. Or if, let's say, the, the person speaking at an event uh, is very easy to hear because they have the amplifier and the microphone and the PA system, but then somebody in the crowd asks a question, you may not hear the question. So I mention that because when you do this zoom to fill and you review it, you can see if there's some spots where it's a little bit quiet, and then you can select those um, just click and select that segment that's quiet, and you can amplify it. And so uh, that's what that process is for. And you'll see the, the next column is normalize volume. Um, normalize volume is sort of an attempt to automatically do what I just described. The software will look across the full, you know, recording and say, well, let's see, we don't want this overmodulated. We don't want to boost it so much that this one sounds distorted, um, but we want to boost it enough that this one's easier to hear. And so it kind of finds uh, a good balance, right? But when there's a lot of dynamic range, when you have, you know, some things really loud and some things not so loud, it's sometimes helpful to just go in and manually adjust. Um, but normalizing would be good for example, if you have a recording that's equally uh, the same volume across and it's just a little bit low and you want to boost it, you can say normalize. I generally prefer to uh, manually increase the volume by uh, decibel levels and check and see how it looks after I increase it. Um, but I put that column in there anyway just to indicate whether or not I'd use that. The next column is apply noise reduction. So Usually, with an audio tape, I like to preserve as much of the authenticity of it as possible, so I don't attempt to subtract out any uh, background noise. Um, and there are a few reasons for this. One is that even really good noise reduction tends to take out some other elements of what the person's saying. So their speech can sound like they're talking through uh, a long cardboard tube or something, you know, it's like it's not, you're not getting quite the, 
the natural sound of speech or of music. Um, sometimes a little bit of noise reduction can help if there's hiss from the tape or um, some sort of annoying background noise, but uh, anyway, I, I indicate that there. And there are different um, levels of noise reduction and depending on what you sample to remove, uh, there could be further notes about that. And if a person, I suppose one way to do it would be to give a customer two copies. So here's a copy without any processing, without any noise reduction, and that's sort of a, an authentic archival original, essentially. And then the second one would be a copy of the audio or maybe even a few to choose from. It says, oh, here's this kind of noise reduction, here's another kind, here's one with it boosted, etc. So sort of like in you know wedding photography, you would give the customer a few sample shots and they would say, oh, I really like the way this looks. Um, so that's, that's noise reduction. And then create MP3, yes or no. Um, now in this example, there was, uh, you know, let's say nothing on side B, so I, maybe I didn't, you know, want to record an MP3 in that case. And then burned a CD. Uh, a lot of people don't need a CD anymore these days. You know, they're going to want to listen to the audio on their phone uh, or maybe on their computer. Laptop computers, many of them don't have CD players, so you know that's that's just a matter of whether or not the person wants that. And then upload to cloud. So uh, in some cases, a person would give me a, a USB memory stick or an external hard drive, and they would say, oh yeah, when you're done, can you put all the audio on this device? Other people might say, oh, you can keep the cassette and I don't need to pick anything up, but just, you know, put the file in the cloud where I can get it. So they could get that file from Dropbox or Box.com. I like using Box.com because it gives me a notification when somebody's downloaded their file. And that way I know, you know, if, if they've downloaded it and they have it okay, I might take it out of the cloud and keep, you know, an archival copy just in case they you know, contact me a year later and say, oh, I seem to have lost that file. Do you still have it? And I could provide that to them. Um, and, uh, you know, unless there was somebody that said, no, nah, you don't need to keep a copy. It's, it's not a problem. I'll take care of it. And then I wouldn't. But um, there's also this option to save to USB, as I mentioned, if they bring me a hard drive. And then any notes about the project uh, are, are going to go in this last column there. So basically, um, that's it. It's, it's a spreadsheet that, that is kind of a record of what is the work that I've done, what steps were taken each time, what settings were used. It's also forward-looking as a checklist of things that I need to check off. And it helps also in the process of, you know, creating this workflow, figuring out, oh, you know, I should add another step here. Uh, I should remember to do this or that, or, oh, here's one more thing I could do that would help these projects go better. Um, so that's the advantage of that. And I, I use you know, similar workflows for a variety of projects. Um, I would have a similar one for LP records, a similar kind of checklist spreadsheet for converting videotapes, and also for video production. For videos like this one, I would go through a checklist of you know, what was it recorded on, kind of a record of what hardware was used to record it, um, any notes about a background music track, and, you know, when was it exported, uh, what was the file size, when was it uploaded to YouTube, and particularly with YouTube, what's the title going to be, what's the description going to be, what are the keywords, what playlist is it going on. So there's a lot of information there, and it's helpful to have a record of that because if you need to go back later and recreate something or you know upload again, you'll have all that information there just to copy and paste, copy and paste, and uh, it's it's very handy. Or if you're using multiple video platforms, you can do that. So anyway, there are benefits to having these checklists to make sure that uh, projects get done properly, completely, in the right order, things are checked off. And I had an email exchange with somebody recently. We were talking about process, and I thought, oh, I'm going to make this video for, for that person and for anyone else who's interested in uh, what, what process I use. And one of the advantages of putting things like this out there on YouTube is that 
there can be feedback from others, you know? So I'll refine my workflow based on feedback that I get from people who have comments. And I really, uh, you know, appreciate having that as well. So it's an advantage to having kind of an open source, transparent business model because you get lots of, you know, input from people. Whereas if uh, a person takes a very secretive, proprietary, trademarked, patented, you know, approach to things. Um, I guess you have your internal people and everybody who's, you know, signed these non-disclosure agreements, you know, can give you some feedback, but it's not the same as having, you know, 7 billion people giving you feedback um, or, you know, the, the public in general. So there, there are real advantages to operating a business as much as possible in the public domain or, or what have you. So, um, and also by, by putting these processes out there, it, it helps to, uh, you know, sort of present it and say, hey, here's something I created. And, and maybe it's even a measure of protection so that if some other company five years from now says, oh, we just developed this system and, and, and you're copying us or something. I mean, you can say, well, OK, you're saying I'm copying something you created a month ago, but I have a video that I posted like 10 years ago or whatever uh, showing that same process. So it, it kind of helps for people that, that you know, don't necessarily want to stop anyone else from using their intellectual property, but who don't want to be stopped <laughs> uh, by somebody, you know, when they want to use essentially something they've developed themselves. Somebody else is claiming that they developed it. anyway. So that, that's something else I like to do is kind of document and timestamp these different um, processes and uh, you know techniques that I use uh, so that everybody can use them and so that nobody can come along and say that that they invented it and they're going to prevent everyone else from using that process you know if they try to claim that so um, anyway yeah uh, appreciate all the the likes and the uh, follows the, the subscribes and comments and um, thanks for watching and have a great day.